in the MASH finale. That is Dr. Sidney Freeman. He is an Army psychologist. That is the character. That's not in real life. He's an actor. And Dr. Sidney Freeman in the MASH finale, known as uh, Goodbye, Farewell, and Amen, has been called upon to uh, treat uh, Dr. Hawkeye Pierce, who has suffered an emotional breakdown after a child that was on the Army medical bus that uh, they had to stop. Uh, they had gone for a day of relaxation at the beach, uh, somewhere in Korea or whatever beach, don't know where. And on the way back, they had to pick up, obviously, some casual, uh, wounded casualties, and a child, of course, died on that bus. And it was in a traumatic situation, and he just shut down, and it was a bad time. And so uh, the episode begins with Dr. Hawkeye Pierce in the uh, medical facility, I believe, uh, in Seoul, uh, South Korea, being treated by Dr. Sidney, and he will not talk about it. He, uh, of course, if you ever watch MASH, uh, Dr. Hawkeye Pierce is always glib. He always has some type of uh, smart, elegant answer. Uh, it's always you know, making fun or, or satiring other people. But every time Dr. Friedman tries to get him to address that trauma, he, he, he will not do so. And so, long story short, he has, uh, after much uh, cajoling and much uh, encouraging uh, Dr. Hawkeye Pierce finally breaks down and shares uh, with much tears what happened and how it happened and how it affected him to the point that he finally has the breakthrough that Dr. Freeman says he needs. And so he is sent back, predictably back to the MASH unit where uh, that is set in 1953 just before the Armistice Agreement. And yet Dr. Uh, Hawkeye Pierce not long back is forced to deal with some very life-threatening situations as combat uh, comes close to where they are. And yes, he has to deal with children who are in dire straits to the point that he does some actions to save lives that are a little bit unorthodox to the point that the colonel, played by uh, Henry Morgan, but known as Colonel Potter, uh, calls Dr. Sidney Freeman up and says, hey, you might want to come check out Hawkeye. He's acting a little different. So he comes in, he's always laid back and basically observes and, and, and watches how Hawkeye deals with another child that's uh, in, a, in a situation. And he realizes that Hawkeye has passed his crisis and that uh, the concern that he had uh, for him has now been alleviated. And so that is the scene from uh, the final episode, two hour episode from 1983, where as the helicopter lifted off, uh, that was the rocks where the uh, landing pad was. And of course, Hawkeye's friend, uh, B.J. Honeycutt, has left a message, goodbye. Farewell and amen. You say, well, that's nice, Brother Ward. You gave us a little uh, snapshot of the final episode of MASH, one of the most viewed episodes, by the way. But how does that relate to, uh, to 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verses really 1 through uh, 13, but I'll be focusing on probably the first five verses tonight. And how does that relate to us tonight as we think about uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, where I have entitled, You Okay? Hey, okay, because Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonian church, expresses pastoral concern for the Thessalonian congregation's uh, continued spiritual health. It is, yes, it is about getting them saved, but once you get them saved and you get them, quote, in the door, you've got to continue up. You've got to follow up and follow through at all times because discipleship is the other side of that salvation experience. And you and I, uh, we are to possess and express concern over our own church's continued spiritual health and well-being. That's where it comes down to that vitality element of our theme. Vision, vitality, and victory. Uh, Paul is a church planner par excellence. He's a theologian par excellence. And he's also a pastor. And a pastor always has the concern uh, over, his, uh, over his flock. A pastor should always know the pulse of his congregation. Dr. John MacArthur states that the Thessalonians uh, have been converted and that among the new believers, uh, there was Jason and Gaius and Aristarchus and Secundus. Uh, I'm sorry, Secundus. And that's mentioned in Acts chapter 17 through 20. And yet there were Jewish opponents of Paul that were there stirring up trouble and so much so that Paul was forced to lead this, this young church plant. And it greatly, greatly anguished Paul. In fact, 
he writes in this letter and expresses that anguish as his pastoral concern for their continued health. And so we ask ourselves the question, how does this concern affect our congregation today? This is a man who was concerned about a church 2,000 years ago. There's not that much difference between the Thessalonian church and its culture and community of the first century AD, other than the fact that we're not located in Asia Minor, obviously, and the 21st century church, specifically Chucky Baptist Church of the 21st century. We face some of the same things. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 33, the Bible says, These things, this Jesus speaking, I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so we are to be in the spirit of Paul, prayerfully and pastorally concerned over the spiritual health of our fellow believers. So, well, now, uh, you're the pastor, Brother Moore. We're not, well, true. I'm, I'm the under shepherd. But in a ministerial sense, we're all. Uh, have that shepherding duty, or at least that pastoral duty, to be uh, encouraging one another, praying for one another, uh, speaking to one another with hymns and songs and spiritual uh, songs, uh, because we live in a world that the world ain't going to do it, so if we don't, who will? Okay? And so, like the uh, TV episode, you know, we, we check up on each other, not being nosy, but we check up on each other. We, we check out, how you doing? Are you okay? Uh, sometimes when I've uh, encountered people that I can sense or have a down moment or they've had an upset or there's something not quite right my first question is are you okay knowing full well on some occasions no you're not okay in the situation this is not okay so let's pray about it and if I can help I will sometimes the only thing I can do is simply be there and listen that is and sometimes maybe that's the only thing I should do uh, I'm, I'm wired to try to okay here's the problem now here's the plan and let's proceed to a solution that may work wonders uh, in, in preaching a you know, point one, point two, point three sermon, but sometimes ministry is not this little neat flow chart. It's really just a ball of yarn all messed together sometimes, and you have to work your way through that. And some of you probably encountered that as well. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be reading from what is known as the Christian Standard Version. It is a little bit different from the New King. New, I can't talk. I'm using my southern name. The New King James. Okay. Uh, let's go with that and then uh, see how we do. Uh, it may read a little bit different from the New King James that I like to use, but it's still a very good translation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. That is in the New Testament. This is a New Ur Bible, so give me just a moment to get used to it. <laughs> All right, beginning with, yes, chapter 3, verse 1 and following. Therefore, and Paul has said, you know, he's very concerned about the Thessalonians, and he has a, an anxiety. He's at like maybe a 10 on a scale of uh, 1 to 5. So that gives you an idea. He says, therefore, when we could no longer stand it, we thought it was better to be left alone in Athens. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's co-worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you concerning your faith, so that no one will be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. In fact, when we were with you, we told you in advance that we were going to experience afflictions. And as you know, it happened. For this reason, I can no longer stand it. I also sent him to find out about your faith, fearing that the tempter had tempted you, and that our labor might be for nothing. But now Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news about your faith and love. He reported that you always have good memories of us and that you long to see us as we also long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in all our distress and affliction, we were encouraged about you through your faith. For now we live if you stand firm in the Lord. How can we thank God for you in return for all the joy we experience before our God because of you? As we pray very earnestly night and day to see your face, to faith, try it again, to see you face to face and to complete what is lacking in your faith. May God bless the reading of his word because the next few words, Paul then actually begins to share a little bit of a prayer. As we think about this, you okay? We see the checkup. And in those first few verses, we see that there's an anxious awareness and an anxious anticipation. 
The reality for the Thessalonians was one of trouble. There was affliction, there was pressure, there was forms of persecution or oppression. In fact, uh, Ellicott, who is one of, the, uh, uh, one of the expositors, says, and I quote, the Greek word contains the metaphor of a vessel over full and bursting with its <clears throat> contents. Basically, Paul is, is so, and it's not that unholy, paralyzing anxiousness, but rather that, that zeal of a pastor who wants to know that his people are doing okay, and, and he's so pent up with it, it's like he's about to burst. He's overflowing with that. That's, uh, that's how he feels. The word uh, that is used for uh, some of the troubles that they face is affliction, and here it can mean tribulation. That's the small t, not the big capital T. That's, we're not talking about the great tribulation, but small tribulation, although for those experiencing it, it ain't small. Uh, it's being hemmed in. It, it's pressure. We Sometimes we live in a culture even today that, that would love to restrict how Chunky Baptist Church does ministry. Uh, we are blessed in grace of God uh, to be able to use the internet as we do through live stream and YouTube. And yet there are those uh, in different circles who would love to, to restrict uh, our uh, freedom to be able to uh, worship how we believe and to be able to share live stream how we share. Now, I mean, none of us are up here ever speaking hate or anything of that nature, but because we do uh, teach and preach the gospel, the good news of God, and we do so in a way that says there's only one way, not many ways, but one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus Christ. Therefore, you must repent of your sin, and by grace through the faith that's been given to you, turn to him, change the way you think and act. That is the gospel. That is the, that's the way the, the old timers did it back uh, 200 years ago. That's the way we do it, and that's the way I hope those who come after us will do it. That's how Paul and, and Timothy and the others did it. That's how we will do it. And there will be others that would say, well, no, yeah, that's not the way you need to do it. Well, we're going to do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, yeah. But do so always speaking the truth in love. Dr. Leon uh, Mars adds that Athens was considered a, a political and philosophically tolerant city. They pretty much would listen to anybody, say anything, unless it was people like Paul speaking the gospel. They would say, you're just a babbler. You're just, you're, you're just talking babble to me. Yak, yak, yak. And they would have scorned him as being uh, intellectually uh, or philosophically ignorant. And so you, you have that to deal with. And so Paul ran into that. And so I'm sure the church at Thessalonica would have run into that as well. So, oh, well, you're not culture. You know, there are people outside the South who think of us as wide-eyed, crazy, uh, radical people uh, who are just, you know, out there and, and right filled with it. Uh, I actually talked to a person on the phone one time who they asked me, you know, don't ask me what I believe and why I believe it unless you're ready for an earful. I will tell you why and I will take you to the Word of God and I'm very passionate about it and I'm not going to tolerate some of this uh, left field thinking. I just, I don't, I don't do that and if that makes me wrong, so be it. I've been wrong before. Uh, not worried about it. So I shared that in the person. This has been very eye-opening, as if me just sharing the gospel on the phone was an eye-opening thing for them. Maybe it was. Maybe they had not ever heard the gospel ever presented. And so we live in a culture not much different uh, than the Thessalonian church. That They would look at us and say, oh, you're ignorant. You know, some people think the South is uneducated. And sometimes they think the church in the South is just as wide-eyed, ignorant, bunch of people. No, it's not. Some of the smartest, most loving people I know are in the South and are in God's church. Okay, um, And so we have the situation where that, that comes against us. And so there's that, always that, that danger of being hemmed in and stressed out. It's like working two jobs. You know, sometimes you can make it work. And sometimes you have a conflict of interest and you feel torn uh, in two different ways. Dr. Newt Larson, who's another teacher, says... Paul and the others knew that these Christians were under great stress from the unbelieving Jews and the Roman authorities. Paul had experienced the hatred of the Jews in Philippi and Thessalonica as riots, accusations, and arrests swirled around the missionaries, that's you know, Silas and Paul and Timothy, and the Christian followers. So the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 14, verses 21 and 22, And when they had preached the gospel to that city, Derby, and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying, We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. 
So why does the church of the 21st century act as if we should have an easy ride of it? We have had, for the last 50 years, an easy ride of it. Uh, we're beginning to see some pushback from our culture and pushback from our society. And sometimes we have like, what's going on? Well, the Bible said it's coming and it's going to happen. That's why we need to be prayed up. The Bible also says in John 15, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. He said, well, that's great. You've established the fact that in ancient times in Thessalonica, they had problems. They had pressure and they had perils. Well, and we established that we had the same today. Well, let me give you an example of how that plays out today. Now, hopefully, this will never be Chunky Baptist, but here's a church that's experiencing that. The Church of Abundance is a house church established 30 years ago in the Xi'an uh, Shanxi province. I'm probably butchering the Mandarin. Forgive me. Uh, the Chinese authorities closed the church because they refused to join the communist um, operated three self church movement, which caused them to be labeled as a cult, which means that their members, some of them have been arrested and detained, others have been threatened. Uh, their pastors have been put under house arrest. Uh, Religious Freedom and Human Rights Watch, uh, called Bitter uh, Winter, said that the pastor Lian. Uh, Shangjian and his son, Pastor Leon Ziliang, were placed under house arrest on or on restricted surveillance. And that's been within the last, say, uh, six months. So, yeah, we're, we're not living in that much different of a time. And I pray God in America that that's never the case. But we saw during the lockdown, we saw during the height of, of the COVID pandemic, that there were those governors and there were those state governments that would have very easily stepped in and say, y'all shut them down. Some actually tried to do that out in California and other places. And so thank God that that was challenged in, in court and many of those court cases uh, were won. But we live in a time where, yeah, we need to be concerned about one another's spiritual health. What the pressures of this age and the pressures of this society and the pressure, pressures of this culture weighing down upon us. We, we do need to be concerned. Why was Paul so anxious? Why is he at, at stress level 12 out of a score of 1 to 5? Well, uh, his chief concern was somehow that Satan might be able to have enticed uh, members of that congregation and turn them away from the Lord. One of two ways. Either get them into error, they're Christian, but they're doing things the wrong way or for the wrong reason. And we have to be, oh, so careful in our church that, that the things that we do in the name of Jesus Christ, that we use a righteous method and that we use the method that you know, lines up with the Word of God and that we are led by the Holy Spirit. And that our method and our motive, of course, honor God. Sometimes we might do the right thing the wrong way for the wrong reason and get off into error and not even realize it. And that's scary. Others that might have been in that congregation might have, quote, joined the church, but did not necessarily join the role of heaven itself. Uh, that's one reason I always give an invitation. I never assume with anybody. Why? Because what if that one time, well, we yeah, haven't given an invitation tonight, ain't nobody going to come. What if, that's tonight? what if that were tonight? And there's somebody that the Lord says, you need to nail it down. I want to make sure that you have that opportunity. Because when you stand before the Lord one day, either at the reward or at the great white throne, you're not going to be able to say, well, the preacher didn't let me have a chance. Then, yeah, you do. Okay? Um, and so we live in that same type of situation. Paul was concerned that the experience of trouble and persecution could shake the faith of those Thessalonians that could have been weak. They might have been deceived, or another word that is used is called disturbed. Dr. Robert L. Thomas says, uh, unsettled describes a state of being shaken or disturbed or lured away through deceptive means. Paul had already told them that trials are an inevitable part of Christian experience. And Timothy had, was come to reinforce uh, this, this warning. Uh, you know, sometimes we have the feeling that, well, Christian life and Christian experience is, is a walk in the park, it's a bed of roses, and it's all sunshine. Well, I would like to say, yeah, it is, but you know that it's not. It's a challenge. 
And when you try to live righteous for Christ, and you try to live out His example, and you try to obey His command, the world is coming for you. You are a target. You have a target front and back. That's why we have to be prayed of and that armor on every single day because, my friends, spiritual warfare is real. So we better be concerned about the spiritual health of our congregation, the spiritual health of our members, those present, those absent, and everybody else in between. Paul comes to Corinth where he met Aquila, who was a Jewish man, and his wife Priscilla. And he lodged with them because they had the same occupation, which tells me that at some point in his life, Paul had taken up tent making. Uh, he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he reasoned with the Jews, and he reasoned eventually with the Greeks, those who would have been from a Greek background but interested in, in Judaism. The Bible says in Acts 18, it says, When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. In other words, you know, there's always that, that possibility that some people are not saved or are going to be swayed by every fad or every teaching that comes down the pike. And others that get dismayed, well, I didn't think being a Christian was going to be this hard. It is hard. But then it's like I used to tell my students. They said, Brother Moore, your tests are so hard. I'm like, first of all, there's no crying and no whining in Bible class. Second, um, my tests are meant to be hard. I said, is anything in life worth having? should be a challenge because you have to rise to the occasion. And when you have um, achieved it, then you have something to be proud of in a good sense. And so I always try to tell them, yes, life is hard. I'm not going to be easy because your life, when you graduate from high school, is not going to be easy. If it is, tell me your secret because I never learned it. So how do we apply that sense of anxiousness and anticipation? Reminder, as Paul is, is expressing this anxiety, uh, I, I call it a, a a uh, reverential anxiety perhaps, it reminds us that relationships are important. It's what church is about. It's what our community is about. And within the church, relationships are important. Every family has its own pressures and challenges. And those things can test our faith. It can, it can shake faith even. And like Paul, our question is, do we have a prayerful concern over them and a prayerful concern for them? It's not being nosy. It's being watchful and encouraging. God may use you. God may use me. God may use us to head off a problem before it ever becomes a problem. Sometimes you'll say, hey, how you doing? That's what being a mentor is all about. That's what being a, a fellow uh, traveler on the road is. Uh, of faith with one another is about encouraging one another, especially as we see the day of the Lord approaching. Prayerful concern for fellow believers is one way that I believe a church can stay healthy and vital and therefore experience that spirit of revival. So, who do you need to check up on personally and prayerfully? I didn't say check up on to be nosy. I'm not suggesting that. Some things need to be private. And if you know something, if somebody shares something in confidence with you, consider it. Okay? A pastoral confidentiality. Uh, there's things I will never share because I've been uh, entrusted with that. That's an honor and a privilege. I will not share it. Why? Because that is wrong. That is not what God has called me to be. So I take those things and I pray over them. But I'm not, well, let me tell you what I heard. No, that's not right. That's, that's wrong. So when I say that you need to check up on them personally and prayerfully, but if you know of something, provided that they're not going to be a harm to themselves or a harm to somebody else, then legally you do have a, a, a responsibility to, to make sure they get help at that point. But I'm talking about if, if somebody shares something with you, uh, especially how they're doing emotionally and spiritually, then you need to keep that. But that becomes something that you can pray over specifically and God can use you to bring a healing touch to that person's heart or a healing touch to that person's life. So who do you and I need to check up on personally and prayerfully? Because that may become an open door 
to direct ministry. Uh, Camp Garraway, uh, well actually Garraway Camp and Conference Center, they, I'm more familiar with it than I am Central Hills, although I've been to Central Hills one time. I've been to uh, Garraway many times. I've taken youth groups there for back when I uh, was at Ben Academy. But uh, that year that my daughter went and did her first week-long summer camp, we were a little concerned. That was her first real time away from us, away from home, and so we had some parental anxiety. But they wouldn't let her have her cell phone. I mean, they kept it, but I mean, it's not like she had it in her room or anything like that. Because they wanted her, they wanted all the participants to stand on their own two feet. The counselors were there watching and praying and encouraging. So we went all that. Well, if there were a crisis, if there were a problem, they would have called. Okay? Uh, if there were a need, somebody would have contacted me or my wife, and, and we would have been in Clinton, Johnny on the spot. Okay? However, I figured no news, good news. So, we'll see. That was a long week. And so we went to pick her up. And of course, I'm kind of, I'm anxious, I'm excited to see her, but I'm anxious and I'm like, damage report. <laughs> you know, well, she had a wonderful time. She had truly blossomed. I'm like, oh, wow. She did not need us. And that's what any parent should want to strive for, is that their child no longer needs them in that capacity. Always needs your parents or, or such, but that she can stand on her own two feet. But yeah, I can appreciate Paul's anxiety over this congregation that he regarded as his spiritual children. But then I would also have you note verses 6 through 10. Not only the checkup that Paul, because Paul was so anxious, he said, hey Timothy, go check it out. Go, go ask them. You okay? So here's the report. Here's the, here's the checkout. It's an appreciative answer. Uh, now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desire to see us as we also uh, to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all of our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. So Timothy has brought back good news to Paul. Prayers have been answered. And that's exactly what Paul was expecting and hoping. His faith in them has been vindicated. Uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 25, 11, like apples of gold and settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. In our time, who knows that God may put it upon your heart to encourage that fellow church member, that fellow believer, uh, that person uh, that is connected to our church. Maybe they're not a member, but they're connected to our church. And in that moment, the right word spoken the right way for the right reason or the right motive might be that healing bomb, the apples of gold and settings of silver. That is an amazing privilege. Also, um, as we look at this, a reminder that in Proverbs 15, a man has joy in an apt answer. And how delightful is a timely word. So Timothy has come with a timely word and Paul is beginning to breathe a huge sigh of relief and thank you, Jesus. You ever had news you know, that something you've been praying about or maybe worried about or concerned about and, and you get the information that you've been wanting to hear and it's good news and but many times, thank God or thank you, Lord. Or praise God. You know, that sometimes I, that's just been automatic with me because that's how I feel. That's, I think, how Paul is doing. Timothy brought godly news. The Thessalonians stood fast, not only in their faith, but in the way they practiced their faith. Um, in the language of the Greek, the word is zoe, and that is the essential life, the experience of, of God's life. In other words, to put it in the context that we can probably appreciate it better, they were living and they were thriving. They're not just existing. They're not just enduring. They're living and they're thriving. And that's what you want to hear. You know, to stand fast means to persevere, to keep on, keeping on, and going on strong. So we want to always have that concern for one another. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 3 John chapter 1, verse 4. It was an affectionate, not only an appreciative answer, but an affectionate <coughs> admonish, admonishing appraisal that is then given in verses 9 and 10. Paul is wanting them to know how much he loved them and how much he prayed for them. And he wanted to be able to supply whatever they need. Now, that's not to say that, hey, uh, you know, look at me, depend on me, but rather that he was praying that God would grace him and empower him to, to be able to, to connect with them. And if there was something that they were falling short on or if there was something that they were insufficient, then he could help them out. 
Uh, my grandfather, who's been uh, long deceased for these 27 years now, uh, 26 years actually, uh, you know, there was many times when he worked at the uh, co-op at the gas station, I'd be on my way sometimes to go to school at Mississippi College, and I always tried to make sure I you know, kept my gas in my truck. Of course, he knew me that sometimes that I might let my gas tank get a little low. And he would always, he'd always tell me to come by, and he'd always, he said, I'll put about $20 in for you. And he did that. Uh, I didn't ask him to do that. He always did that. He, he wanted to make sure that I had enough gas to make it to Clinton and either stay there <laughs> or make it to Clinton and come back. Uh, he wanted to, quote, spot me. Well, that's exactly what Paul's doing here. In fact, Paul is using in the, in the language of the, of the New Testament, the way that it's worded, it's like mending fish nets. And Paul would have known a little bit about that. Nets to become worn and torn. And so therefore they needed to be mended and, and made strong. Like a bone that gets broke and you have it set so that it will eventually grow back together and hopefully be stronger than, than it was before. Now, I'm not a medical, so I may be wrong on that. Uh, I do know one thing. Uh, in sports, when you have your game and you play, and let's say that you had a, a win. Well, you celebrate the victory. You celebrate the win, but then the next day, then you analyze it. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? What were the missed opportunities? And what were the opportunities that you did exactly the way you were supposed to do with an eye towards, as a mentor told me a long time ago, perfect practice makes perfect. And I know the bar is high on that, but think of it this way. If you learn it right the first time, then you practice it right every time, then you can perform it right any time. That applies not only to track and field or, or football, it also applies to spiritual life as well. Paul is wanting them to be able to continue to develop. So as we apply this, as we close tonight, I'll share just a few thoughts. Nurturing and nourishing our relationships, especially our Christian relationships, in times of trial, but also in times of triumph. That's a big deal. Very big. New believers, new members, need to be a prayerful priority in our efforts in nurturing our relationships. And that becomes a source of joy and encouragement that goes both ways. And last but not least, when we realize the role that we play, maybe helping others to stand firm and to keep on keeping on, and we're living out our faith the way that God intended, the church becomes a true community of caring, Christian compassion. And that is important to being relevant and credible in the community that we live, in the culture that we are a part of, the world outside our doors. Charles Spurgeon said, As the fairest flower lies packed away within the little shrivel seed, and wants but time and sun to develop all its beauty, so perfection, glory, immortality, and bliss unspeakable lie slumbering and hidden away within the grace which God has given to all his people. He that believes in him hath everlasting life. The life of heaven is begun within the believer. It is germinating. It is daily developing. It shall in God's good time come to its absolute perfection. And I would add to that, that's why we encourage one another. That's why we are concerned for one another's spiritual health and well-being. And that's why we pray. Tonight, perhaps, the Lord has called one of you to check up on your own spiritual health and condition for the very first time. And to nail it down, I invite you to come and to make that decision to trust Christ publicly. It may be that the Lord is calling you to check upon your spiritual health and condition again, anew. In other words, you're saved, but you know, check it out. Sometimes we need to. That's why I go to the doctor. Uh, that's why I go to uh, the nurse practitioner. Not just if I have sniffles and a cold, but you know, you still have a medical checkups. Or is everything working? Are you okay? Maybe tonight you just need to come and pray. And, and start that checkup so that you can be okay God's way. And then tonight, maybe the Lord is calling you to check up on the spiritual health and condition of your brother and sister in Christ. Will you do that appropriately? Will you be willing to affectionately encourage others? And tonight, maybe the Lord is calling you to unite with this church in some special ministry or in some special man manner. Come, come on, and we can 
um, we, can, we can nurture our relationships together as we seek to not only be a healthy church, but as we reach out to this community. So I invite you to come to the altar as the Lord leads you, asking yourself the question, are you okay? And that's an important question to ask. So stand as we sing a hymn of invitation as our worship leaders come. And you come. Are you okay?